All right, Emily, here we are. Where are you, by the way? Are you already back in Texas? Yes, I am back home in Abilene, Texas. Wow. Did you use straight private jet right back home? Yeah, I just drove <laughs> uh, all day yesterday. Oh, snap. Oh, right after you won, you just made, you drove all the way back. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's kind of impressive because I was looking at potentially driving up to uh, – because you're actually just west of where – I'm in Dallas, so you're just west of us. And uh, for those that don't know or aren't good with geography, that is a decent drive. So that is some impressive stuff. Uh, is there a reason to get back home quickly? Was there – you got a tournament coming up or something like that? Um, I am in the middle of a purchase – of an RV. Oh. oh, so yeah. Exciting. Wow. Yeah. Well, I'm sure the, uh, the check that you won at this past tournament definitely is going to help with that. Um, but let's just jump into it because I think some of us that pay attention to FPO has, have seen your name pop up on leaderboards from time to time this year, but there's a lot of people that don't just have no idea who Emily is. And so I wanted to kind of, before we get into the tournament and breaking all that down, give you some time to kind of explain a little bit about yourself. Um, first thing that jumps out to me is the age, 18 years old. So like, where, where are you at in your life as far as, did you go to college? Were you thinking about going to college? Like where, where is that all fit in now with disc golf? Uh, so no, I did not go to college and I, haven't ever really thought about college just because I've been playing disc golf since a very young age and it's kind of always been my dream to go on tour and try to make that work. Um, I think if tour didn't work out then college would be something I turned to. I just don't know what for but um, yeah I, I went to public school through elementary and middle school and then I went uh, back um, I went to homeschool for high school. That way I could focus more on disc golf and not have any other distractions from it besides just getting the schoolwork done. Um, and in that time, I really saw my disc golf progress uh, very fast. And then after I graduated, I went on tour for like just the Texas swing. And that's all I was planning on doing. And I saw that, like, I did pretty good. And I was like, well, maybe I should try this out and just make my rookie year a one to remember. So that's, that's where oh, I'm so at. Oh, so you're saying this year was – you're saying this year you were planning on just playing Texas events. And yes. then because of your success at those events, you're like, well, let me, let, me, let me enter a couple other ones. Wow. Yeah, exactly. Wow. Okay. Um, and, and so it sounded too like this was something at a young age that you are trying to pursue like other athletes in other sports. Is that correct? This is something that you're like, this is what I want to do for a living. Yes. What, um, I think if we go back, you know, 10 years or so, that would probably be a pretty crazy thing to like could try to convince your parents at a young age, like, Hey, I want to be a professional disc golfer, but what has transpired these last couple of years um, that has made it to where that was something that you're like, Oh, this is something feasible. This is something I can actually make a living doing. Um, my parents were a huge help. They, they always would like encourage me be like, this is going to be you one day. Um, and everybody back here in Texas, like, they all were like, I can see it. You're going to be on tour. You're going to be up there with the, you know, the top ladies. So I think just the encouragement from everybody else and them seeing that I can do it helped me see it in myself. Nice. And I'm sure like some of the bigger contracts with Paige, Kristen Zatar, those type of things where you're like, hey, the money is out there. Um, because as we all know, it is very difficult to make an actual decent living just by tournament winnings, unless you're playing a tournament every single week. Uh, Cause a lot of people don't factor in the travel, the gas, the mile, all the stuff. I mean, you're about to buy an RV. It is expensive. And so if you don't have outside money coming in, uh, it is difficult. Um, 
I am curious though, Abilene, Texas, what, uh, what courses are you playing out there? Uh, so the main course that I play is Will Hare and it's a little, it's an 18 hole course. It's short. We don't have any long courses here. Mm. Um, but it's like kind of technical. There's a lot of OBs. Um, but it's probably one of the easiest courses that (laughs) probably anybody would play. Um, but that's that's my favorite course here and then we have cal young which is the my second favorite here it's a little bit longer not by much um more open not as much ob there's a little bit of water um but i think that that's kind of where i got my distance from and i don't have much of it because like i said every 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 hole's pretty short here in abilene um but so so there's a lot of people that are probably in your situation. And I mean, I can relate to being in Dallas. A lot of the courses that I was practicing and playing at before going on tour were those 200 foot, 230, you know, 50 feet of just a sidearm stand, whatever it may be. And then you go on tour and you're like, oh my gosh, this is a completely st- different style of disc golf. What advice do you have and what have you done to be able to make that jump from playing local short courses to now going on some of the longest courses on tour and being successful at them. So for my courses, I uh, kind of learned that like low flex shot, just, you know, that's, that's my go-to shot. If you've watched any coverage, everybody knows that that's my go-to shot. And uh, that I think helps me a lot on tour because sometimes you just need that just low flex shot. You know, if you have that low flex shot, some other girls don't have that. They have the big hyzer, they have the Annie shot, but sometimes that like just keep it in the middle straight shot is, is, is a difficult thing to get. So, you know, if you can just get that, I think you'll be doing, you'll be doing really well. Um, but also just, you know, every course is different and you're out there, you're learning the lines. Um, you just have to, especially first year on tour, you just have to like believe in yourself cause it is your first year there compared to some that have been there for years. And you can't just let that, you know, get to you because you can't do anything about it. So just do with it what you can and have fun doing it. Are you going out to like fields and trying to increase your distance that way? Since, you know, the courses that you're playing, you're not really required to throw far shots. Uh, not so much. I don't love doing field work. I don't know what it is about it, but I just never see any progress. I see the most progress when I'm actually playing around on a, on a course. Uh, so no, not really. I think the only thing that I use field work for is, uh, my forehands. Hmm. Okay. Is there so is there a goal in mind to start playing courses that are longer to uh, maybe start trying to generate more power, more distance? Because like you said, you know, you have that very and if you go back and watch how you played this past week, I mean, you threw the same shape shot maybe 10 plus times and it was it looked perfect, perfect the last round, too. And the round before that, actually, you're throwing really great shots. But is that something that you're like, hey, for me to be able to compete at some of these other events, I need to be able to throw 50 feet farther or I need to be able to have a big hyzer spike shot? Is that something that you're looking to uh, develop over the next couple of years? Yes, um, I do plan on focusing on like going to the gym in the off season. So hopefully the gained muscle will help play into that but uh uh just kind of tweaking my form over the off season as well uh, because i know it's not perfect will definitely be something that i do and working with rob to kind of get the the distance thing down because he's definitely got that down Mm -hmm. yeah for sure for sure and for those that don't know you're talking about robert burge yes gotcha gotcha yeah it was it was fun i was uh we, you know, we had, we had a decent amount of backups, unfortunately on Sunday. And so we, I was on hole eight and we were just posted up there and I'm watching, you know, you guys play 
And I see Rob like walking up the the fairway of seven. He played right behind me and he's just looking at his phone. I'm like, oh, he's probably he's probably watching FPO coverage as well. Um, yeah. So some ex- some exciting times there. Um, so you kind of mentioned you started playing disc golf at a very, very young age. How did you find, learn about disc golf? What got you into it? So my dad got me, my mom, and my brother into it when – I couldn't tell you what age I was. I just know that I was really young. I was playing mm. soccer back then. It was elementary school. And I would just bring like a soccer ball and kick it around, maybe throw a few discs, but it was like, I wasn't really interested. Um, slowly, I started getting more interested. My brother started getting less interested. So we kind of like swapped. And mm. um, I just started taking it more serious. Sometimes I would have like month long breaks because I would just get frustrated and be focused on something different, you know, maybe a school sport. Um, but like I said, once I went to homeschool in high school, that's whenever I started really getting more into it and realizing that that's really what I want to do. Um, so, I mean, that's kind of the path that I took. It was it was stressful because I know my parents saw it in me when I was really young. And they were kind of pushing me to play more than I wanted to, but they didn't push too much, which I think is good because I still stayed in in it, you know. Uh, but I know that I probably stressed them out a little bit with just being like, "No, I'm not going to go play. I'm not." But now I'm here, so I think I think they're pretty proud. That's awesome. Yeah, it's 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 got to be such a fine line as a parent on pushing your kid enough for that that way later in life, they don't look back and be like, man, I really regret not giving my, my best effort, but also knowing the line of when it's like, okay, that they really don't want to pursue this anymore. Um, so I'm sure there were still signs of you loving disc golf as you just kind of had to get over that hump a little bit. Um, all right. So a lot of people talk to about, you know, coming up through the ranks of disc golf, and you know earning your stripes before you play on tour and it looks like you have certainly done that kind of going back and looking at where you started you know you started playing juniors i think what was it f14 might have been the first division you were playing in or is it 12 it might have even been 12 was it f12 i think it's i think it's 12 yeah yeah. yeah, I think oh, I yeah. think you might I be. Got a, I got I think, a trophy here. Yeah, it's true. It's true. Oh, there you go. Okay. <laughs> um, so going all the way back into 2018 is kind of when you start playing your first tournament. Then you moved up into FA2, FA1, and then recently you're now obviously playing FPO and you're playing on the tour. Do you think that kind of helped you, kind of going through the state, the different state, the different levels, different stages of disc golf? Yeah, I mean, I think it did. Um, I got to meet, I got to move up with a lot of women in um, like Texas. <clears throat> so it was always kind of the same people that I was playing with because there wasn't that many around West Texas. It was kind of hard to find competition. Um, but yeah, moving up and realizing that like, oh, wow, this person used to beat me all the time and now they can't, you know? It, it showed me how much I was progressing and it felt really good to see that and kept me motivated to continue. This is actually a, a great, great topic here to talk about a little bit because I think sometimes people <laughs> really look at like the ratings to get a gauge of where they are skill level wise. Um, and this past tournament you shot, I believe your first, ever thousand rated round and then you followed it up with another thousand rated round so what you just said right there i think so many people can use that to like help them gauge where they at skill wise and if they they're getting better or not versus the rating system because again the rating system i don't know if you've listened to our podcast it's so flawed i hate the rating system um, especially for like professionals but do you do you kind of value that as well as like, hey, don't look at your number after your round. Don't look at your number compared to other people in the country. Kind of compare yourself with, like you said, I get beat by this person every single tournament. And then uh, to all of a sudden, you start getting closer and closer. Like, has that kind of helped you? Or are you like a person that 
you know, it's Tuesday. Are you looking to see what your rating is this morning? <laughs> Uh, so I did look at my rating this morning only because me and my dad are kind of going head to head right now. Um, okay. so I was, Friendly competition. I was, yeah, I was nine thirty six, and he just moved up to nine thirty six, but I moved up to nine forty. And so oh, he's nice. like, he's like <laughs> talking about how he, he doesn't have a chance and it was funny, but, um, I definitely focus more on who I'm beating or who I'm losing to versus, my rating, but my rating still is, I'm still looking at it. And it's probably, honestly, it shouldn't be, but it is probably very important to you for sponsorships, getting into tournaments, all those things. That's where, that's where to me, I don't love it. I don't like it. I also don't like it. If you know, you know, you played really well as far as the rating goes this past week, but let's say you went out there and you would have won, let's say you won DMC with a 960 rated, average people are going to look at that and downplay it so that's the other reason why i don't love it too much but speaking of people that you beat let's talk about this real quick because i saw this and i thought this was fascinating this past november 2023 you played in vpo which is a local a tier tournament here in dallas big big a tier tournament uh and you lost to holland hanley by 37 shots mm -hmm. fast forward 245 days later and now you have beaten her and everyone else in the FPO field. What's changed? What what was the drastic? What's what's been the drastic change between uh, those two hundred and forty five days? Would you say? Um, I would say the different mindset with that comes with being on tour, um, and just confidence from also being on tour. Just it's like different disc golf. Um, like it's not just your normal A tier and below it's, it's getting out there. You've got ratings are better because they're not based off of like the men, the MPO rating, you know, and that's how it is in most A tiers and below. Mm -hmm. And so that definitely helps is like your mindset. And I know we were just talking about ratings that does help my mindset because it's like, I could shoot what I think is a really bad round, but it still could be over my rating and I'll be, I'll be okay with it. You know, I'll come to terms with it and just do better the next day. Uh, but so that helps. And just, I guess feeling like I'm fitting in everybody welcoming me, just the overall mindset of just being there helps me play to my best abilities. Is there anything in your game that has improved in those 245 days? Is there, hey, I used to be terrible at circle two putting, but now I'm a lot better? Or is it simply just my game's always been there? I just need the confidence to be able to go out and do it? I definitely, my game has definitely improved. <clears throat> uh, C2 putts, definitely. I used to jump putt, now I do a step putt. It's a lot more accurate. Um, I don't find myself like, pulling it as much or missing left as much um so yes c2 putts i think my my drives have gotten a lot more consistent and my forehand has gotten a lot better when did you when do you decide to step putt and not is it a specific distance or a specific you know if it's an uphill putt or a downhill putt because i because on hole 17 I believe you were outside the circle by quite a bit and you didn't step putt. So when, so, when do you, when do you make that decision on step putting or not? So I know I have a lot of power just in my standstill putt and it's kind of just, if I feel like I can't get it there with just a standstill, I'll switch to the step putt. It's, it's not like okay. a certain distance because sometimes I'll feel it from a certain distance and Another day, I won't feel it from the same exact distance, and I'll be like, I need the step. And it has gotcha. to do with wind, um, definitely uphill or downhill. Downhill, most of the time, I will not step putt, uh, just because it's it's a little bit easier to get it there downhill. Uh, uphill, um, you'll see me step putt a little bit more because okay. I feel like I can't get it there. Um, okay, so we talked a little bit about, or you talked a little bit about how this year's schedule has kind of drastically changed from just playing on 
plan, planning on playing a few events in Texas. And now we see you kind of popping up all over the place. Are you now like after winning this, is that now changed even more? Are you planning on doing even more events this year than you were in the past? And are you essentially a full-time professional disc golfer now? Uh, yes, to pretty much all of that. I, I had already planned on hitting up all the tour events that I can. Um, and so that's that's kind of what I'm doing. I'm trying to finish out the year playing as many as possible. And I do believe that I am a full-time tour disc golfer now. So what are like the big goals now? Like, what do you, what do you have? Cause I'm sure your goals have definitely changed. Cause I doubt you jumping into tour. You were like, Hey, a goal of mine is to win my rookie season. So now that you've won, are you now having to like make new goals? Like, Hey, I want to, contend at a major i want to qualify for this i want what what are your goals for the rest of the season now i haven't really thought much about goals because i just kind of take it day by day and try not to have like super high expectations especially with it being my rookie year but i do think that in the back of my mind i'm like i want to i want to win like one more you know at least at least one more Um, just to just to feel I guess more satisfied with myself because I know that I can now. And so I think if I, if I didn't, then I would just be like, I could have done better. And I don't want to have that feeling. I want to have a, I did great. And I know that I, I know that I'm doing great. I just want to, you know, do it for myself. How, how has, uh how has social media been for you? Are you big on social media? Do you have an Instagram that you post on? Are you making YouTube content? So I do have an Instagram and a Facebook that I post on daily whenever it's tournament time. Um, like that being normally Friday through Sunday, posting about my rounds, going through my rounds. Um, I would like to get more into social media and I, used to have a YouTube account, can't log into it anymore. There's not much on it. So probably okay. in, in the near future, I will get a new one and try again. I'm really bad at talking to cameras, so it'll definitely take some work. But um, yeah, I do plan on being more active on social media, especially when a sponsor comes around. Um, but as of right now, I don't, I don't think I do enough and so it's something that I need to work on. Are you, uh, we, we've seen from some people, both on the MPO and FPO side, uh, struggle with, you know, maybe the fans pressure of, hey, we want this from you. Hey, you need to be doing this. Or if you start playing poorly, people coming after you. Is that something that you feel like you can be, you can handle decently? Um with, I mean, because you're going to have a whole bunch of more eyeballs on you leading up these next couple of events that you're jumping in. Is that something that you're ready for? Yeah, I'm ready. Um, I've always had like a pretty big fan base back home in Texas. And so I've always had these eyes on me. And I think I know a few times I've been like, well, I really don't want to disappoint everybody. And I feel like I am. Um, but it honestly just drives me to play better it pushes me and motivates me to do better i don't really take it as something bad um i just i take it in the best way that i can and i don't i've never let um like crowds or anything like that bother me like it's always made me play better because i'm a little bit of a show off uh so i just live in the moment and have fun with it (laughs) that's awesome yeah i mean uh, the that's great to hear because for disc golf to continue to grow, you're going to need more media. You're going to need more people talking about it. And when you have more people, uh, I always kind of say it like a, as like a, a young YouTube channel, right? And it sounds like you kind of created your YouTube channel. When you just start creating your YouTube channel at the very beginning, the only people that are like watching your videos and commenting on your videos are like friends and family. Those are the only people that like have seen can can find your videos. Then slowly it starts kind of separating to other people that are like, oh, I really like this content. 
at a certain point in time though, your video might get out to like a weird wide audience of people being like, what the heck is this? And then that's where like the negative comments come in and some people can handle it and some people can't. And I think that's right now where like disc golf is, is disc golf has been this very close knit family. Everyone love everyone. Everyone is awesome, but it's starting to kind of branch out into more of a, a modern sports uh, media when media is concerned. And so now you're starting to get the negativity of where you're having people say like, Oh, this person isn't very good at disc golf anymore saying certain like things. And some people can't handle it all. And it sounds like you're kind of up for the, uh, the task and like almost you take it as like a challenge. If someone was like, let's just, let's just assume that the next term, it doesn't go well for you. Right. You're going to have probably a lot of people be like, Oh, she was just like a one hit wonder. That was like a rare occasion. You're going to use that to fuel yourself going forward. It sounds like. Yeah, for sure. I'll probably just I love that. look yeah. at it, laugh at it, and move on. Yeah, I love that. That's awesome. That's fantastic to hear. Um, okay, so you're playing full time now. And it sounds like from what you've said so far, and maybe some of the little birdies that I have in my ear, you're not currently signed with anyone. You have no sponsorship? No sponsorship, no. Any emails coming through this past day? Any any Instagram DMs? Anything like that? I have been talking. Um, okay. So we'll see what is to come. I'm not like rushing into anything just because, you know, I have been playing really well with my mixed bag. And mm -hmm. I don't want to just, you know, like cut that and finish the rest of the season with something that I'm uncomfortable with. So I'm definitely going to take it slow and do things the correct way. Yeah. I mean, honestly, it would be fascinating if you were the first one to really be like, Hey, let me finish out my season with the disc that I have. And I'll just wear your hat. I'll just wear your name on the back of my shirt. I'll, yeah. I'll randomly, you know, you can now use my name and likeness on disc and stuff, but let me, I don't know. That would be, that would be very interesting. And I, I think that's a smart play because I think some people in your shoes would be very quick to be like, Hey, let me get a sponsorship. And now all of a sudden the next week you're playing with a whole new bag and you're trying to learn it. Um, I like that play for you. And also too, you're kind of betting on yourself too, right? Like if you end yeah. up playing and like you said, win another tournament, all of a sudden the the numbers on that contract might be a little bit juicier. Yeah. And like, I, I don't need a, a sponsor to get, to finish the year out. You know what I mean? Like I, oh, I can nice. finish the yeah. year out by myself and I'd be completely fine. And so that's why I feel comfortable with taking things slow and continuing to use my mixed bag that I'm comfortable with. I like that. Um, you now become the fifth first time winner on tour this year. Uh, the previous record of that was two. So what is happening right now? Are we just seeing a uh, completely more parody in the FPO field where you, you know, in the past it used to be if Katrina or Paige was in the field, one of those two was going to win. Uh, we saw a little dominance from Owen Scoggins, obviously Kristen Tatar, who hasn't been in the field lately. But are we starting to see like a, a, a new change in the FPO? Are you seeing that as well the last several tournaments you're, uh, you've been at? Yeah, I think this year people really came to, to fight for that number one spot. Um, I think a lot more people are opening up and getting out of their shell and, and playing the disc golf that they know that they can. And it's really awesome to see everybody competing with each other and not just being, you know, one or two people up at the top. Um, I'm glad that I'm here this year because it seems like the most competitive year that we've had so far. You still there? Sorry, cut out a little bit. Yeah, I'm here. Oh, okay. Sorry. Go ahead. What, what did you hear last <laughs> Uh, you were saying that you were glad you're on tour this year. Yeah, I, I'm glad I'm here on tour because um, it seems like the most competitive year we've had in a while. And the competitiveness is always something that gets me going. 
Nice. So let's talk real quick. Let's talk about Alpha in the room. This this is happening at pretty much the last several events ever since Kristen got injured and has taken time off tour. We've had two different sides of the argument. Some people, uh, you know, Yuli on our last podcast was saying, hey, Kristen's letting all these women get these wins under their belt and getting the confidence of winning. She's going to come back and find, oh my gosh, it's a lot harder. I'm on the side of, hey, I think everyone that's winning right now, it's awesome. But I got to believe in the back of their head, they're like, what's going to happen when Kristen comes back? So where are you on that? Are you thinking, hey, this win was awesome, but I really want to beat her at, at an event? Like, I want to get a W with her in the field as well? Yes, definitely. That that has been something on my mind is is when she comes back, I want to – I want to prove because, you know, we've seen all the posts, all the comments talking about how there's only new new winners because Kristen's gone. And I want to be the one to prove those comments wrong. And I think that I can. So I like it. Yeah, I mean, I, I was wrong at the beginning of the season. I said Kristen was going to win every event. I said no one was gonna no one was gonna beat her this year, and like it it did, only took a couple of events before we started seeing like Evelina and some other uh, ladies actually win. So um, I think all of this is, I mean, obviously the dominance that Kristen has had these last couple seasons has been incredible. But the thing I think that we're all driving for and all want is like competition. We just want to mm-hmm. see people going back and forth and seeing who's going to take it at the end. And the more names that are in the mix that can do that, the better. Um, so I love to see it. And I think, I think we're all excited to see the first event that you and Kristen are both at. Uh, let's see here. Okay. Let's jump. Let's jump a little bit now into the actual tournament here. So Des Moines challenge. What did you know about the course coming into it? What did you know about the event? Was this the first time Play, I'm sure first time playing the course. Yeah, so I didn't know much about the course. Um, I just came in, practiced it. I thought it really fit my game, so that was that was my first round, which was on. What day are you getting in Monday. practicing? By the way, it was Monday. Okay, you're getting in on Monday. Okay. Yeah, so played my first practice round on Monday. Um, I played really well that day. And it gave me confidence for sure. I felt really comfortable on the course from the get-go, which doesn't happen a lot. Um, and then I played Tuesday and Wednesday. Tuesday, I, I played pretty well as, as well. Um, but I don't think I finished the round because I, I got really exhausted. Like I, was, I was so tired for some reason. Um, and then Wednesday, I had a little bit of a rough round but it still was under par. So I was like, okay, even a rough round, I'm still shooting under par on this course. That's good. Um, But I also was like, if that's what I'm doing, that's what other people are going to do as well. Under par is going to be something Mm -hmm. that isn't, isn't great on this course. Like you're going to have to be pretty deep under par, which wasn't true because I shot two under par the first round and it put me Mm -hmm. in contention to, to win it. So now I did have to go, eight down eight down I guess I didn't have to go eight down the last round but you know I did that and that was what I was hoping to do was get a round eight down for each round okay so I I definitely felt really comfortable coming in practicing um it was my first time playing the course was my first time in Iowa there's there's a lot of firsts like any of the courses that we're playing on tour i've i've never seen them before never played them how was uh you you know you 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 spoke about first round you probably weren't super thrilled coming off the course with your score but you looked at what everyone else was shooting and this is a perfect example of where it's like don't look at the rating just look at what everyone else is at and after the first day honestly that win was very tough uh, not just for FPO, but also for the MPO field. Um, the way that it was gusting made a lot of shots a lot more difficult. And uh, for those that have never gone out to Picker Park, the wind is really the big defense out there. They don't, it doesn't have too – they've added some, you know, whole 17, 18, a little bit more tougher this year. Uh, and they've added a little tighter OB in here and there. But when the wind is down, the course is, completely plays differently. 
And so looking at it, yeah, I mean, you're four shots after round one, you're four shots back of the lead, but you're only one shot back from a, a tied for third. So you're feeling probably pretty good where you were, you know, you didn't, you felt like you didn't play that great. Uh, and looking at your score, uh, your scores here, it looks like you just weren't able to really to get anything going. Uh, whenever you kind of started making a birdie, you know, you had a couple birdies here, then you would take a bogey. Uh, you had a bogey on 17, but then it had a nice birdie on 18 there to finish your round. Um, let's fast forward here to going into the final round. You're five shots back from Owen Scoggins. And at this point in time, Owen Scoggins is probably the most dom- uh, like the most dominant or at least the scariest person to have to try to beat in the field right now. Um, what are your thoughts going into it? Are you thinking in your head, hey, I have a chance to win this tournament? Or are you thinking, hey, I just want to place high. I just want to try to get as much cast as possible. What, what's your mindset going in five shots behind the own? So I went in with the mindset of like top three. I was like, I just, okay. I just want to get a top three. Uh, whether that's one, two, or three, don't don't really care. I'm gonna be happy with any of them. And I also, I know I called my mom and my dad before the round, like the day before, mm-hmm. and I talked about. I named every hole that I can get a birdie on, and every hole that I'm playing for par. And I didn't do what I thought I would do. Cause I know the interview in the beginning of the tournament, I got interviewed Thursday. I said that the front nine was more birdieable for me than the back nine. Well, mm-hmm. my rounds didn't show that I, I birdied the back nine more than I birdied the front nine. And I, I don't really know why, but going in, into the last round, I realized something. I don't have to get every birdie that, that I think that I need. I just have to keep it clean and get the birdies where I can because my round felt very slow in the beginning and it was really slow in the beginning because I went birdie and then it took like five pars until I got another birdie. Mm -hmm. You know, I just, I just played smart. I played safe. If I didn't get off the tee well, I just didn't go for everything. I wasn't playing super aggressively. I was just, you know, going for birdie when it really looked easy and going for par when it wasn't. And especially I know in the end there, I had a few shots that I didn't get off the tee very well on like 16. I was like, okay, I didn't get off the tee, but by the grace of God, I was in bounds. So don't give yourself a chance to get a bogey. So I threw a really good forehand, put it right next to the basket That way I was like, all right, I'm going into 17 and 18, just took a par. Let's see what I can do on these. If I get, if I get out of the opening on 17, uh, the way that I did, I'm going for the birdie. And then 18, my game plan was exactly how I did it. That was, I wasn't changing game plan for anything. Even if I was winning at that point, I was like, I'm not going to change it because if I change it, I could mess up even more than just going for it you know so i just stuck with my game plan and it worked thank thankfully yeah i i think uh we'll, we'll talk a little bit about the finishing stretch and and the game plan because i find that very fascinating with disc golf i think a lot of that has to do with just how the, the courses normally are set up for us of where it is smarter just to keep doing what you've been practicing and what you uh, we're planning on doing regardless of where you are in the position. However, I do see that causing some problems in the future. If the course is actually changed to where it's like, yo, you should, you should definitely just lay up and then chip around and play it that way. But um, before we jump into that, you mentioned you birdied hole one. So you got off to a great start and you got to be thinking, Hey, I need to go out and, this is the same way on the MPO field. I need to go out and shoot six, five, seven under on the front nine. That is where the birdies are. And then let me pick and maybe try to hold on on the back nine. So you being one under through six, and are you looking, did you look at the score and see, 
okay, I'm fine. Like no one else is actually playing that well. Cause looking on league card, um, you had, uh, Ellie Ezra was one under through six. Uh, Natalie was two through six. Own was even through six and Holland was one under through six. Are you looking at scores throughout the, fi- uh, the final round at all to know like where you're, you're, you're at with everyone else? So I didn't look at scores until hole 15 of the last round. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. I try to hold so what off. Ca- what, so how'd you keep your composure there? Cause like in my head, I gotta be thinking like I'm one under through five or six, like, I need a birdie out to have any chance at this. And I would probably be running putts all over the place. I'd be going for crazy shots. Like how did you keep your composure after, after starting that slow? So I know that like me getting that way, me being mad or frustrated that I'm not shooting as well as I should be through six. I'm not going to sit there and be like, wow, this is awful. I need to completely change my game plan and be more aggressive. I'm thinking, okay, I I can't change what I've already played. So just stick to game plan because you had that game plan for a reason. So stick to it and just expect it to work. And that's what did I did. You have like, someone I, I the... Sorry, go ahead. I didn't get like in my head about not birdieing that much on the front nine. Um, just because like it, it, it was okay. And I know that like 10 down probably wasn't going to happen again because it was a little bit windier and I was just, I don't know. I, I just didn't, I wasn't really thinking about everybody else. I was just thinking about me thinking about even if I don't get a top three, like it'll probably be okay. But if I just shoot kind of a solid round, I have a good chance at it. Um, It looks like you did have a caddy. So is that super helpful to have someone that you can kind of talk to throughout the round and kind of bounce ideas off of? Or if you maybe do miss a putt and you get a little frustrated, you can kind of have that. A lot of players, they want to try to have that with each other. And sometimes you're on a card with three other people that are like, bro, I'm not. I'm not like your caddy. I don't really care what's going on in your round. Is it nice having someone that you can kind of talk to throughout your round? So, yeah, it was, it was really nice. Um, shout out David for caddying for me. He's great. Shout out David. Um, he definitely helped because I was bouncing ideas off of him. I was like, okay, yesterday this disc didn't work on this hole and the day before it didn't work either. So maybe I should, disc down to like something straighter like my leopard three and i just would like run that idea by him and all i was looking for was him to put some confidence in it for me and so him being like yeah i think that's a great idea that's all i needed and it helped me to throw the shot well and even if i was missing putts he was like hey that was really a still or that was still a really solid putt and he'd give me a fist bump it's just a constant like reassurance um, throughout the round that just kept me in high spirits and kept me going. Yeah. It's, it's actually awesome to see. I think Lee card, I think everyone had a caddy. I think Evan Smith was carrying his own bag, but he did have a caddy with him, um, which is completely different than when I first came on tour. No, like everyone wanted to carry their own bag. No one wanted to have caddies. And I was always thinking like, what are you guys doing? Like just having someone carry your 20 pound, 15 pound bag for three days around the, like that saves you so much energy, uh, mm-hmm. even if they're mute and they're not going to tell, say anything to you. Uh, it still makes no sense to carry your own bag, but it is awesome to see now FPO and MPO alike both having caddies out there. All right, let's jump into your round hole 11 here. I just want to f- go straight and And I, this was one that I circled because I thought this is something that you could give a lot of advice to you know, a lot of the people that watch our podcast here, because this happens all the time. Hole 11, your second shot, you're throwing through the gap. You throw a good shot. It lands by the basket. But the way the hill is, um, the way the hill is co- for us, our vantage point, we can't really see what ends up happening. We can't really tell. Did it stop? Did it not? 
And it ended up picking up, uh, kicking up and kind of rolling quite a ways. So mm-hmm. did you think it was close? And then as you were walking and approaching, you saw that, oh man, it's actually not close. Yeah. Yeah. So I was looking by the basket. Or did you, kn- or did you know it wasn't close? No, I was looking by the basket because I thought that it ended up in bullseye. And I get over there and I ask like some of the spotters, I was like, where'd that, where'd the purple one go? And they're like, oh, it's right there. And it's in in NC2. And I was like, oh, well, yeah, you know, it's a bad break. I threw a good shot, got a bad break. Make up for it with a putt. That's, that was my So, yeah. Okay, because a lot of us <laughs> have a little bit of a different mindset of where we're walking up being like, oh, this is going to be a tap-in birdie. Heck yeah. And then you walk up and you're like, wait a second, I have to make a putt. And sometimes that that change of thinking in your head you have a birdie already, you've already marked it down pretty much ver- uh, in your head that it's a birdie. And now seeing like, wait a second, I have like a 35, 40 footer. You, you quickly just kind of don't even think about it. You're just like, ah, well, I just got to make a putt now. Mm -hmm. yeah I don't ever celebrate too early so in my head I wasn't like oh that's a birdie because I didn't see where it ended up um so I knew that there was like a possibility that it rolled I did not like scratch that out I was just like just get up there find where it is and go from there okay nice yeah me and me and Yuli have joked on this podcast before where you know we'll have our our caddy basically be like oh that's parked and then we walk up there and it's 25 feet and we're like that that is not parked that i have to make a putt here um and and sometimes that is a little bit tough when you have already mentally put in your head like i'm gonna birdie this hole this is marked down and then you get up there and you're not um, okay, so let's talk real quick. To me, you you know, you've already said that you're not looking at scores on hole 15, but the putt on hole 12, that is where I thought, okay, she's done. Like I thought your miss birdie putt on hole 12, I thought that was going to be the beginning of the end. I thought, okay, well, she had a good run. She had a chance to win this thing. She needed to make that putt, didn't. Um, and cause in my head, I'm thinking like, as the round goes, the holes get harder and harder to birdie. And, you know, you're right neck and neck with all now. Nat- I think Natalie at that point own all those people were kind of right there hauling and they all had some of the easy birdie holes coming up. They hadn't played yet. Um, how, like, what, what were your, what was going on in your mind once you kind of, you know, I think you clinked it off the, the top band. Was it, mm-hmm. was it off the yeah, top? Yeah. What's, what's going through your mind there? Is that, is that all thinking, like, do you have those thoughts come in your head real quick? Like, Oh, well that's it. Or are you just able to stay positive and don't even have to like push out those negative thoughts? So actually walking up to the putt, I had, I felt a lot of pressure to make it. And in my head, I was just like, you know, I knew I knew what my score was for the round because I just had it in my head. That's just how my mm-hmm. mind works. Um, but I did not know it in the standings. I didn't know what anybody else was shooting at all. Um, so I was like, okay, I'm, I'm pretty sure I was five down at that point. Um, yep. I was like, I'm five down. I probably could use this birdie, but I am I probably won't really need it if I'm wanting a top three. I was like, you know, I... If I miss it, it's not the end of the world. If I'm missing a putt, it's going to be a putt for birdie. And it's, it, you know, par at worst is what I'm thinking. So I wasn't really, I wasn't really too mad that I missed the putt um, just because I was having some doubt in that putt. And I don't really know why because my putting was, was looking really solid. Um, it, you know, it just, it. Yeah, you just made a 40 footer the, the hole before. Yeah, it comes and goes. Um, but yeah, I, the wind kind of came through the, the trees in a way that I didn't think it would. Uh, and I didn't aim for wind. I aimed for no wind because, you know, we're surrounded by trees. It's like you, you really don't think that it's going to be much of a factor in there. But it was. And I just just took it and move on because, you know, like I said earlier, there's nothing you can change about what you've already done. So just fix it on the next hole or fix it on the next, you know, four holes. Yeah. And it sounds like too, 
you know, sometimes we will have a good round and we just, if it's a good round, we don't even think about anything else. We don't even think like, oh, I probably could improve here or there. Even though you won this tournament, from listening to you talk back, it does sound like you have gone back and thought about different areas of your game where you're like, that's something that I need to work on. That's something that I can fix. Um, because like you said, you know, you are going to have Kristen in the field, Evelina, Hennett, you're going to have other people in the field. And if you want to try to stay on top and try to win, you want to give yourself as many chances as possible. And so I, I like hearing that from you that you're not just like, Oh, I won the tournament. Let's go. But you're still looking at your round as like, Oh, these are things that I can improve on in the future mm -hmm. to get even better. Yeah. Um, all right. So I do have this question because initially I was like, all right, well, you're not playing on lead card. So it's, I, you don't have that lead card pressure, but I'm looking at the people you're playing with. Cat Merch, Haley King, Missy Gannon, who Missy Gannon was charging to up the leaderboard that final round as well. Mm -hmm. How is it, you know, going from playing, you know, your local events with, you know, people that you've grown up with and played against your whole life to being dropped in and playing with, some of the top FPO players in the world. How, how is that transition for you? Uh, it's honestly been a really smooth transition. Like I look at everybody as just a person. Um, you know, I just be my friendly self and everybody else. Like I said, everybody's been really welcoming. Everybody's been really friendly, treating me like I've been there forever. And that helps a lot with, feeling comfortable playing with these players. Um, I know the first time I played with Haley King, she, after the round, said that it was really great to finally play with me and that she really enjoyed it. And I enjoyed it as well. She's great. Uh, <clears throat> Missy Gannon, she's so sweet. And Kat Merch is like one of my best friends out there. So <clears throat> I was really I was really comfortable being out there, playing with a good card, um, and I find myself every weekend being like, oh, wow, I have a really good card of girls. Like, I'm excited to play with these girls every round. And I think that's great to have an entire field of girls that you're just happy to be there to play with, you know? I like it. Yeah, that's nice. Um, okay, so you kind of talked about this earlier, but I want to bring it back up. Because watching through your final round and kind of how you were talking about your, your, your go-to shot is that like flat flex kind of line. Uh, and you were hitting it perfectly almost every single hole out there. I didn't see any forehands. I didn't see any forehands. And so I'm thinking in my head, like, Oh my gosh, here we go again. We got another, another player that was able to just win a tournament because it didn't require any forehands. And are they going to struggle? You know, that's going to be the question. Can they win again? They don't have a forehand. And you threw a nasty scramble shot in hole 16. Like that is not the camera doesn't do that justice. That hole, there are so many trees and the gaps are so tight. Very, very difficult shot. And you threw it very, very nicely. So where would you right now kind of put yourself on the four on your on the forehand market? Uh, as far as like FPO goes? Where are you where do you compare yourself with where your skill level is the forehand? Um, I mean I definitely, it could use some work. I do often go forehand for my op shots uh, just because I'm more comfortable and I can, I'm, you're, you're staring at the basket here, you know, and when you're doing a backhand, you're looking away from the basket. And so I find that I'm more accurate with a little forehand approach shot, which is why that shot on 16 was just, it felt so easy for me. I'm hitting that shot nine out of 10 times. Um, mm -hmm. so I was, I was super confident in that shot. Now, when a driver gets put in my hand, it's a little bit different. Um, I've, I've been working on it, working on it, and I've seen a lot of improvement, but there's still more to improve on. It's not the most consistent. Um, it's not the farthest, but it's definitely there when I need it to be there. And that's all that I can ask for. So when you're looking, you know, you're playing that final round with Haley and Kat, are they throwing forehands on holes that you're like, man, I wish I had that forehand. This hole would be a lot easier. I don't really remember 
much of them throwing forehands. I do know that I think it's hole 13. Um, Mm -hmm. I first round two people on my card threw a forehand and it worked out really well for them. And I was like, man, I think I should take that line, but I'm just not comfortable with it because I didn't practice it. Um, So I think going into next year at the Des Moines challenge, if I, if that hole is the same, I'm probably going to opt to a forehand for that hole. But um, I do playing playing on tour. I do see people take the forehand line, especially like own. I see her take a forehand line that I'm just like, yeah, wow. I I didn't know that was there. Um, so yeah, sometimes it's a little bit intimidating that you know these girls have every little aspect, but. I, you know, I'm my own person. I gotta, <clears throat> I can, I can throw an Annie just as well as some of these girls can throw a forehand. I can make that work, mm-hmm. but I also have the forehand if I need it. It is there. It's just, it's just not as good as some of the girls. Yeah. And you, and you lean on it when you need to, you know, like the, mm-hmm. to me, having the forehand is so, so valuable in the woods and scrambling uh, more so, like you said, it, you know, if you have the anti turnover backhand, a lot of these holes, you can kind of get away with that off the tee. Uh, you don't have to really force the forehand. Um, okay. So you're looking at scores We're we have now come, we're past hole 16. You're looking at scores. The putt on 17, you had to know how important that putt was to put the pressure on the the ladies that are behind you to force them to have to play pretty much perfect golf on the way in um so like how good of a feeling was that when you made that putt and did you quickly have to be like holy crap i'm going to hole 18 a very difficult hole so yes i i knew um that i needed that putt and i knew that um like when I made that putt, I was I was very excited. But quickly, I, I have I have a saying that I got from my dad, and that's game face. So it's like, yeah, I get excited about this putt, but right back to game face, because you can't just let like the excitement take over, because then you you're liable to make a mistake. And 18, honestly, wasn't a hard hole for me. I didn't look at 18 mm. and be like, this hole is difficult. I looked at 18 and I was like. It's a pretty simple hole. You know, you throw a hyzer, you throw an annie, and you try to make a putt. That was all it was for so me. So you that second shot, are you trying to miss on the right? Are you trying to say, hey, if I'm missing this thing, I'm throwing it into the woods on the right? Yes. Yeah. I actually thought okay. that I did throw that up shot into the woods. I didn't know that hmm. it was inside C1. I thought it was I thought it was in the woods. I was like, all right, well, I'm taking it far. That's what I was telling my caddy. I think there was like uh, camera on us uh, we were talking after I made that shot and I was just like I'm pretty sure I just threw it into the woods but par's okay and he was just like we'll see whenever we get there yeah I was when I was watching that I was thinking to myself I was like alright Emily just needs to par this hole to force Natalie because at that point pretty much everyone had kind of fallen out of it um, Own Own was taking bogeys uh, Holland went on a par stretch so it was really just, uh, I believe Natalie was really the only one that could kind of track you down there at the end. And when I was watching it, I was like, just take a par. Just take a par and fo- force Natalie to have to birdie eight, uh, have to birdie 18. And then, you know, see what happens in the playoffs. Like, go to the playoffs and see what happens. But the way, the more I was thinking about it, it's like, there's not really a really, like, you threw a great tee shot. There's not really a uh, a way for you to safely play that hole for par. Like your safe play is the shot that you threw. So is yeah. that what you kind of meant by like saying like you're not going to change your game plan and like try to pitch up to the corner and now all of a sudden you have a nervy like 200 foot up shot that you're like oh I don't want to mess that up. Yeah. So I was yeah I was just sticking to game plan. I all all my mindset was was get out of the opening on the tee shot. If I get out of the yep. opening on the tee shot, I'm going that anti line. 
had I not gotten out of the opening, had I hit a tree, I would have laid it up and like at the like the turn there, I would have just laid it up mm-hmm. in that opening there. Um, but that that was all I wanted. And then with the putt, I was like, I'm. Did I'm you know very, that was for the win, pretty much? Yeah, yeah, I did. Um, okay. I'm a very aggressive player. Like I, I play aggressively, especially with my putting. So there was no shot that I was going to lay that putt up or anything because uh, I was really confident. It was a C1 putt. It wasn't like uphill, downhill, nothing. It was pretty flat there. Not really any room to make a mistake. And I was confident that if I missed it, my comeback putt would be short because I never – you'll never really see me like flying past the basket because my putt Yeah, you have actually a really – you have a really good putt. Like you give it a good chance to go in, but you're right. There are some people on the FPO and even on the MPO where if they airball a putt, you're like, well, they have the same distance coming back. You, your putt's very similar to like Yuli of where it's more of a touch putt of where it's coming mm-hmm. in to the chain softly versus you trying to like blow up the chain. So yeah. that probably does make that whole, like that putt on hole 18, like a lot less scary. Cause you're like, if I miss it, it's, I'm going to have a five footer. Yeah, exactly. And that was that was all I was thinking is just, you know, there's a crowd here. Make it. <laughs> there is a crowd. <laughs> so. Um, okay, so you you make the putt and at this moment in time, I don't know if you went back and watched the live coverage. At this moment in time, Ian Anderson actually had declared you the winner of the tournament even though Natalie could still throw in to tie you. So the tournament technically was not over at that point. Um but I'm sure in your head, you're thinking, I feel really good about this. But are you immediately like, someone give me a phone. Let me see. Like, I need to watch coverage to see. Like, how, how did that play out for you from making the putt to seeing basically both of their drives going OB and knowing that it was game over? So I was kind of all over the place there. I made the putt. Everybody was giving me a hug. Um, and then, yeah, you'll see me on my phone for a while I was like watching them like I was you know how they have the uh like OB after one throw that's what I was seeing Mm -hmm. and so I was just watching the live scoring and just waiting for them to come up but like everything I have really bad anxiety so everybody around me was like talking and I was just sitting there like okay (laughs) all right gotta gotta like focus in and not freak out you know but I stayed really calm. I actually did not have the reaction or the feeling that I thought I would have had winning. Like mm. I, I thought I would cry the first time I won and I didn't, I was just, I was really chill. So it was weird, but I mean, I don't have a problem with my reaction. Yeah. You went with it. Yeah. And I, I think that was the first, what was it? The first time someone won off the chase card in like several years too, uh, in FPO. So yeah. again, kind of goes back to the parody that we were talking about of where if you weren't in the top four going into the final round, you weren't winning the tournament. And now we're seeing like that might not be the case moving forward, which I think for everyone, that's a lot, of, a lot of excitement there. Like having someone push the field in front. I love that. Um, thoughts on the trophy. We love talking about trophies here. Any, I, uh, I love it. you know, do you have it? Uh, where are you where are you showcasing that bad boy? So right now, or is it like one of those? Was it one of those where you like take it and then you give it back, or because I saw that there was like engravings on past champions? Yeah, so I take it with me for the year and I bring it back. Um, okay. To them next year, but um, yeah, it's it's in the living room right now. They have my parents put it like by the TV. When I got here last night, they took a picture of it and posted it on Facebook and said, the champ is here. And everybody nice. like, got excited that I was home. So yeah, it's, it's in there for them to look at right now. But I really, I really yeah. love the trophy. It, it is so beautiful. It's, it's huge. It's heavy. Um, the flowers are great. I actually met the girl that put all the flowers in there and did the arrangement and she's super sweet. Oh, wow. And yeah, she did a great job with it. Yeah, I, I thought the same thing. I mean, I think that the trophy looks great by itself, but the flowers really actually kind of put the whole thing together. I mean, it looks like a massive trophy. 
Uh, so I, yeah, I, I loved it. I thought it was really, really cool looking. Um, all right. Last thing we're going to talk about here, uh, unless you have other topics that you want to talk about, because, you know, I think a lot of people like to have different perspectives or like to hear different perspectives on the pod, but I do want to bring something up that we've mentioned here on the podcast before and, you know, going through coverage and watching some stuff. I noticed that you like playing with AirPods in. So with that being said, what are your thoughts on the AirPod situation? Um, and what do you have to say to those that think AirPods should not be allowed on tour? Um, okay, so I play with my left one in and nothing in my right ear. I have my music down enough that I can hear everybody on my card. I'm normally one of the most talkative on my card. Uh, so it's not stopping me from communicating with my card. It's not stopping me from having a good time. I'm not being rude by any means to anybody on my card. The only time I'm saying I'm asking somebody to repeat themselves is literally because I cannot hear. And that's not because of my earbud. That's just a me thing. Um, but the music, it keeps me like if, if I, if I see myself starting to shift mindsets into a, a negative one, I just focus on my music. I just, you know, you'll see me like, like dancing around. I'm always having a good time keeping the vibes up because my music is there to like calm me down, keep me, keep me on ground level. So, um, I don't think that having earbuds in is a bad thing. I know that there's a few people that do on tour and I've played with some of them. Eliezer is one of them. Nobody that I've played with on tour that plays with earbuds in has ever been rude has ever asked me to repeat myself because they couldn't hear me because of their earbud it's not a problem and i don't i don't like people leaving negative comments like oh well you know no other sport allows them so why does this sport why does it matter if it is allowed we're not doing anything against the rules so why are you bashing us you know um i just don't think that leaving negative comments about it is is the right thing to do by all means do you know what you please you can you can leave a comment if you'd like to but um if it's not bothering anybody on the card if it's not affecting the gameplay i don't see the problem in it so two follow-up questions first one being, uh, you know, I don't actually wear headphones or listen to music unless the only time I can I really do that is like when I'm working out. And I've always, you know, we've all, we've all, if, we, if you work out with headphones, it's always happened before you get down, you're about to like bench press. And all of a sudden, like the song, like that you were, you know, getting juiced to all of a sudden changes. And it's like a weird song. And it's a completely like, I, I can't, I can't bench press to this song and you got to change it. How does that work with like putting or throwing? Like, I'm assuming that happens sometimes of where you got a song that you're going, you're going, and all of a sudden you step up to the tee and it turns to like a really weird song. Are you having to change the song? Or are you just like, oh, I guess I'm throwing with this weird song in my ear? Like, how how does that work for you? So I have a I have a playlist that I listen to every time I play that I created. So all the songs on it are songs that I'm like, oh yeah, I, I can play disc golf to this song. So I don't really have that okay. happen. But even if I did, no, I'm not stepping off the tee to go change the song and then getting back up to tee. I'm not going to affect the time like that just because my song isn't correct. I'm just, you know, um, I also, I mean, are you, I, like, I are love- you waiting for like the bass drop when you're putting? Like if you feel like the, you know, the beat is, is building, are you wait? Like how I, I, I've always just wondered how that works of like when you put and stuff during the song, like, does that matter at all? Definitely. Sometimes. Um, I know the only time that I'm really thinking about it is the tee shot, um, on hole one. I always play, okay. I always play like a certain song, um, depending on the day. I'll be like, oh, I want to tee off to this song today. And I'm going to tee off to like okay. this part of it. And that's about the only time that I think about that. But any other time, if it if it seems like it'll align good, then maybe definitely not on putting because putting, I don't think about matching it up with the song because that'll like kind of mess me up. Um, yeah. 
you know, I just stick with my my routine and putt whenever. The okay. song, the music's just there to keep me calm when I'm, like, overthinking. So my second question is, and it's it's kind of the response that we've gotten from everyone that talks about it is they, they use it as like an enhancer. It helps them play better or keep calm or whatever. So you we might end up finding, you know, the Disc Golf Pro Tour or the PDJ, whoever it may be, might end up finding, hey, this is something that people are using to gain an advantage. Now, I agree with you. Anyone and everyone is allowed to use it. So right now, if you are using it, you're not breaking the rules by any means. But I could see in the future them being like, this is something that we kind of want to remove and we don't want to have. So if have you thought about that happening in the future? And if so, like, what are you going to do to kind of be able to remain calm without music? Um, I mean, I can make do with whatever. I've played tournaments without an earbud in and I've done fine. Um, I know sometimes if if I'm being that negative, on myself to where my music isn't helping, I will take my earbud out and I'll literally just focus on my card mates to try and bring back my spirit. Cause a lot of the times, you know, if, if music isn't helping, then maybe talking to a friend on your card will. So I think just being able to talk to the card will be fine for me. Um, even, even if gotcha. it's not that, if it's maybe my caddy talking to my caddy is fine. Yeah. I, I don't, I'm not really worried if that happens. I, I'll find a way around it. Nice. Nice. All right. We're going to finish it off. This is everyone's favorite part of everyone's interview is pet peeve. So if you don't know, we basically ask everyone that comes on, like, what are the things that get under your skin that happen in disc golf? This could be stuff that you see on the pro tour. This could be stuff that you see in your local scene. This could be literally anything. And it could be super serious or it can be super funny. Uh, it doesn't really matter. It's really whatever uh, you find. Hey, this is something that just really irks me, really gets under my skin when I see this or when this happens. Do you have anything that pops off? Um, oh man, that's a good one. <laughs> There's not a lot of things that mess with me just because like a lot of the times if, if I'm throwing specifically, I'm not, it's just me and my shot, me in the basket. Like I don't let any outside noise or anything bother me unless it's like a loud bang or a loud scream or someone like intentionally doing it at okay. the, this time of my throw or the time of my putt. Yeah. But other than that, no, not really. I don't, I don't really, that's a good question. I've never really thought about that. Um, outside it sounds of like golf, nothing really gets on. Yeah. Nothing really gets under your skin. It sounds like. Yeah. I mean, outside of disc golf, I have pet peeves. I would, I know that, um, like, I don't like going out of turn. So if somebody's like, unless it's, it's a tap oh, in putt, interesting. if it's a tap in putt, that's fine. But if it's like, Hey, I'm, I'm trying to fix my bag or I'm trying to like put this jacket on, you can go ahead and go for pace of play. I would rather, oh, sit you back. Hate that. I would rather sit back <laughs> and wait. Cause it's going to mess me up. <laughs> I know that I had it happen. Um, or I waited on somebody to, uh, put, put their, fix their bag or something and they told me afterwards that i could have just went and i was just like yeah i, I i'm not gonna do that because it was <laughs> you know it was your turn you can take your 30 seconds you were fine you weren't rushing um i wasn't rushing you and i just wasn't comfortable with going and and that's for me to choose because you were out and i was you know it wasn't my turn yet so yeah, that's probably what my pet peeve would be is like me going out of turn. If anybody else does, it does not bother me at all. But me specifically, <laughs> I will feel bad about it. I think I think you're going to start having all these uh, people start asking you to go. Be like, hey, I got to use the restroom real quick. You can go ahead. Mm -hmm. uh, you just you just gave a little insight into how people can beat you in the future. Is just yeah. keep, keep trying to force you to have to go before them. Mm -hmm. um, all right. Well, um, any sponsor shout outs, any, any shout outs that you want to give while you're on here? 
Um, I'll shout out my main sponsor, which is Ray's Energy Abilene. They are energy drinks and, or uh, they're kind of changing into course fuel. So it's like snacks, energy drinks, um, all of that jazz. And I should have some with me going back on tour to like Ledgestone. I should have some Ray's Energy, some snacks and stuff, especially with the new RV that I'm going to have. It's a little class C. I'm excited about it. Um, I'll have a lot more room to like carry stuff with me. So, um, yeah, shout out to them. Shout out to my parents. Of course, love them. Uh, any place to, you know, support you and buy a disc or anything like that of yours? Uh, just through me. Uh, I normally answer messenger Instagram. I do have some discs with my stamp on them, um, that I'm willing to ship out, but, uh, okay. I don't know how long they're going to last because I'm back home. And I know that a lot of people are <laughs> wanting them back home. Um, so we'll see. So what's the, uh, what's your Instagram so people can follow you? Uh, it's emily.weatherman. There you go. All right. Fantastic. Do you have anything else for the people? This was awesome. You did, you did great. This was, this is really good. Uh, just believe in yourself. Always believe in yourself. Cause you can do it. There you have it. All right. Well, I appreciate it so much. Thank you. Next tournament you said is Ledgestone. Yes. Next event. Mm-hmm. There you have it. All right. Very cool. I know me, myself and everyone watching, we'd be very excited to kind of continue to follow your journey. I mean, it's a crazy story thinking that you were just going to play a couple of events in Texas. And now all of a sudden you're a winner on the disc golf pro tour. Uh, crazy, crazy story. I appreciate you jumping on here. Thank you so much. And we wish you the best of luck moving forward. Yeah, thank you for having me.